Get ready for more silence for a while, and then more questions, and then more talk and lunch. But anyway, here we are. Because University for a Day uh, occurs near Constitution Day, which as many of you know is on September 17th, our Constitution is usually on the agenda. The document is so important and seminal to our identity that we can study it and interpret it forever, and I guess we will. Today we have the good fortune to have with us a distinguished young scholar who earned his law degree from the Yale Law School in 2006 and the following year his PhD in government from Harvard, both with distinction. Professor Rana, who teaches at the Cornell Law School, will focus on the rise of interest and respect for the Constitution in the 20th century and the impact of what he refers to as constitutional veneration on our politics and public policy. His book, The Two Faces of American Freedom, addresses the subject boldly, especially with regard to race relations. Um, hmm. One minute. Immigration and presidentialism, if you haven't heard that word before, I like it. I'm certain that his perspective will bring new, new insights to our views of the Constitution at this moment in history. Please welcome him to the podium. Can everybody hear me? Yes. So I think I'll probably stand a little bit further away from the podium. Um, Excuse me, does, it, does that work for you? Not too far away. Okay. <laughs> Not too far away. <laughs> so uh, first I'd like to thank uh, Sandra for this invitation, that it's a real pleasure to be here. I'd also like to thank Emily Breeze, who did all the work arranging my trip. Um, this is a, a really exciting day of events, and I feel honored to, to be part of it. So as Sandra mentioned, what I'm going to be focusing on is what I'm calling constitutional veneration and the rise over the course of the 20th century in reverence, support, and esteem for the Constitution. Now today, this might seem like just a self-evident fact. We love our Constitution, that there's near unanimous political support for the Constitution across the, the political spectrum, so from the Tea Party on the right to Occupy Wall Street on the left. There's some legal academics, particularly since the financial crisis in 2008, that have been raising questions about, well, is the Constitution really suited to address our contemporary concerns and problems? And the worries that they have about the Constitution have to do with the structure of the document. The fact that the structure of government instituted through the text divides power across a number of different sites at the national level, but also at the state and federal levels. And that what these divisions do is they provide a series of veto points for those particularly with money and power to influence decision making, to halt the possibility of pursuing various kinds of reforms, especially reforms that address socioeconomic issues. And so this has been a renewed concern by academics. But what's interesting is that it's a concern that really hasn't reached either a broader public discourse or the conversations that politicians, elected politicians, social movement activists, those that are part of, let's say, the political elite in this country, that it would be unthinkable in some way for a politician that's seriously considering a run for president or for president, a senator, a Supreme Court justice to say, I have serious concerns with the structure of government and I question whether or not the Constitution actually institutes the right kind of political order. This would be something that would be a surprise. If we went back a hundred years ago to 1912, three of the top presidential vote-getters either had explicitly written saying that the Constitution needs to be fundamentally changed. So Woodrow Wilson had famously written a series of books in the 1880s and 90s where he argued for a move toward a parliamentary system. Teddy Roosevelt, who finished second, one of the central architects of his platform, Herbert Crowley, had similarly said that the Constitution needs to be significantly amended. The fourth vote-getter, uh, Eugene V. Debs, who was from the Socialist Party, had as the basic platform of the Socialist Party getting rid of things like the Senate, moving toward an easier, easier amendment process. There were individuals that were seriously considered for the Supreme Court that had called for a constitutional convention. 
That's a very different kind of atmosphere. So why did it change? What happened? And I'm going to work through the history, not just because I think the history is interesting to see how far we've come in some ways from the early 20th century, but also because it ties to some serious contemporary questions that we might have with how we should organize political life today and the basic debates we have about politics now. A key reason why the Constitution is viewed as so sacrosanct at present is because of a story that all of us in some way are familiar with, even if it might not be explicitly stated in our conversations, which is that part of what the Constitution does is it's not just a structure, but it's a symbol, and it's a set of traditions. It's the way that we argue about good and bad, about political justice and injustice. And the way that we argue means that over time, by using constitutional traditions and practices, we've moved the country toward better ends, toward more liberal, towards more egalitarian ends. This was a country that at one time had extensive practices of slavery and segregation. And even though at various periods in American history, those practices might have viewed as, consi as consistent with our constitutional order, it's through constitutional discourse. So this argument goes, that we've overcome the worst elements of the past. And I don't want to diminish or disregard this view because there's no doubt that the Constitution and the narratives, traditions of interpretations, legal practices, debates around it have played a central role in reforming American life, have been central to some of the things that we're most proud of in contemporary American life. But I do want to make this story more complex. And I'm going to make this story more complex by talking a bit about the national security origins of the Constitution. Now, thinking of the national security origins of constitutional veneration today might be surprising because another kind of related story about the Constitution that, that's familiar in our debates is that the Constitution is the thing that limits or constrains the worst excesses of what you might call, quote unquote, the national security state. In other words, the treatment of detainees, the use of government action to, um, to uh, attack dissidents and various types of protest. And the thought is that over time, it's the Constitution and its traditions as well that have inhibited the willingness of government actors to use the worst elements of state power to undermine the rights of citizens as well as individuals abroad. Now this too has some profound <coughs> truths, but it also is less complicated than what the historical record suggests. And in fact, the rise of the Constitution as a venerated document emerged in tandem in interesting ways with the emergence as well of the national security state before, during, and after World War I. And that the ways in which those two were linked together suggests that it's not simply that the Constitution and its traditions inhibit or limit the worst <laughs> excesses of rights violations, but it's also the case that the Constitution has been itself a powerful language for promoting practices that we might be uncomfortable with. And so we have to recognize the ways in which the Constitution and the politics around the Constitution combine perhaps irreconcilable tensions between liberal egalitarian values we might have and illiberal practices that have been just as essential to the American record. So I'm going to work through these thoughts by focusing on three different related issues. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about, well, what was our public discourse? What was the culture around the Constitution that existed before the rise in the 20th century of what I'm calling modern constitutional veneration? Then I'm going to spend some time with how it is that the Constitution initially took off as a document of extensive support, how the Constitution became a mass public and political commitment, focusing on the national security origins of this development. And then I'm going to end with a few very quick reflections about what this means for the contemporary present. So what was the climate around the Constitution in the late 19th century? 
The first thing to note is that over the course of American history, from the founding, constitutional support has gone through peaks and valleys. And what the Constitution means, what it stands for, has also changed quite dramatically. And I can talk a little bit about that in question and answer. But by the time we get to the late 19th century, support for the Constitution is really facing one of those deep valleys that there's profound disillusionment and disappointment both with the document as a structure of government, as a set of institutions that organize political life and political decision making, but also with the document as a symbol of national <coughs> unity, as something that represents what it means to be American as a kind of national identity. And what this tells us is that, again, our contemporary sense that the Constitution is inherently good, necessarily produces just outcomes, and central to patriotism and national identity is something that was constructed politically through a set of struggles over the course of the 20th century that wasn't really consolidated until the 70s. And I can discuss uh, that process of consolidation too in question and answer. So what was the environment like in the last decades of the 19th century? So we just had Constitution Day, so September 17th. In 1887, to celebrate the centennial of the Constitution, there was another effort to organize activities in September by an organization that was a private organization called the Constitutional Centennial Commission. They wanted to have a set of events in Philadelphia, in Independence Hall, around the, the majesty of the Constitution. They tried to get funding from Congress. Nobody in Congress wanted to get funding. <laughs> They tried to get a national poet to provide a poem to lead off events. They couldn't find any poet to serve as the national poet. They were turned down by a number of orders to give a speech on the Constitution. Finally, an associate justice named Miller on the Supreme Court ended up agreeing to give the speech. Many of the notables that they invited to take part in the events to attend declined. And if you look at the correspondence within the commission, the basic reason that's being articulated in the letters is that we can't get interest in the Constitution. There's no public interest in having this event. E.L. Godkin, who's the editor and founder of The Nation magazine, hardly a radical, he becomes associated with the Republican Party and then with mugwumps for kind of independence uh, in the later part of the 19th century writes in the nation that there's a reason why there isn't a ton of interest, and it's because for a lot of people, even if they're not going to say it explicitly, they're not going to say we should get rid of the Constitution, they still feel that the constitutional experiment in a deep way has failed. And you can think of this for two distinct reasons in the late 19th century. The first has to do with the Civil War. The country has just fought a war that is, by some accounts, the most brutal war to that date in modern history. 600,000 people have been killed. The country has been completely torn asunder. And what is it that Yale Godkin says? He says the point of the Constitution was to do two things. The first was to find a way to navigate political unity between slave and non-slave states. And the Constitution failed on that score. The second was to create something like a national identity out of distinct local colonies and states to navigate the problems between federal and state authority, and in particular to ensure that while states had some degree of autonomy, there was a growing sense of American nationalism. Godkin's a nationalist. And the Civil War proved that it failed on that score too. And this view about the consequences of the Civil War was something that a number of different social constituencies felt and experienced. For radical Republicans that had been trained in an abolitionist political tradition, the Constitution in the antebellum period was a pro-slavery compact because it strengthened through the states the voting power and political authority of the southern slave, uh, slave power. 
And in Reconstruction, they saw those same institutional dynamics, indirect rule through the Senate, the Supreme Court, as again limiting and inhibiting the ability of Congress as a unified agent to pursue multiracial democracy, to ensure that slavery also meant the elimination of white supremacy. For Southern sectionalists, many Southern sectionalists were, that were white were unreconciled, and they viewed the Constitution as they viewed the Declaration of Independence as a symbol of Northern control. During Reconstruction, African Americans came out to celebrate the 4th of July. Many whites in states like South Carolina and elsewhere stayed indoors out of protest. For African Americans, the experience was more complicated. The Constitution through the Reconstruction Amendments had become a real symbol of the possibility of equal and effective citizenship. But what had happened to those Reconstruction Amendments? They'd become dead letters. And so the experience had been one of bondage to freedom, back again to bondage. And the Constitution, if it stood for certain aspirational principles, was also mingled in public life with deep disillusionment. And for many poor African Americans, especially rural free people that remained on plantations that now faced various forms of coercive labor control, the, the constitutional project had always, in some deep sense, been incompatible with goals of fundamentally altering the social structure of Southern life by handing over economic power through control of these plantations to African Americans. So you have a number of constituencies during this period that are disillusioned. And what makes this even more intense, what makes this even more intense is the fact that the late 19th century sees the rise of industrialization. And through the rise of industrialization, new economic inequalities and hierarchies, the consolidation of corporate power, vast disparities in wealth between rich and poor, and just like, let's say today, some academics are concerned that the constitutional system has too many veto points, makes it very difficult for ordinary citizens to pursue their own ends, while making it very easy for those with money and influence to thwart or block policies, this was a common position among middle class reformers that were organized through the progressive movement, among rural white workers in the South, as well as parts of the West, that were organized through the Populist Party, and especially among those in the emerging labor movements. What's interesting is that if you took a snapshot of public opinion in 1900 about the Constitution, it might be the case that you have some folks that are saying, well, we need to change the text entirely. We reject it. We should start again from scratch. The Socialist Party was strongly committed to these views, and we shouldn't dismiss their power at this time. A million people voted for Eugene V. Debs in 1912. But most people weren't willing to go that far. But they were disappointed with the nature of existing institutions. They wanted change, and they wanted some fundamental changes. The folks, and really the only folks that were committed to keeping the Constitution and protecting it as it was, were business figures, and those especially in the legal elite. So the people that made up Chambers of Commerce and the American Bar Association in 1900. If you named your organization, as some organizations were called increasingly as the country moved toward World War I, something like the National Association for Constitutional Government, a group that existed, that immediately identified you in public life as a conservative, pro-business organization. And the Constitution itself was very closely identified as a pro-business document that was tied to property interests. This is interesting because I, you, you, some of you may know this, some of you may not, but one of the most important left of center or liberal leading uh, legal organizations today in this country is a group called the American Constitution Society. If you were to call your organization the American Constitutional Society in 1912 or 1925 or 1900, that would have meant only one thing. This is a business organization committed to property rights. A very different view. So what changes? The main shift 
actually has, in some ways, less to do initially with developments domestically and more to do with the emergence of the U.S. onto the global stage, the ways in which the U.S. became a global power in the late 19th and early 20th century following the Spanish-American War, which led to the American annexation of not just Puerto Rico, but the Philippines as well, and especially in the lead-up to World War I. You have a number of different political actors, interestingly, across the spectrum, so not just now on the right, that make arguments that the U.S. has to play a much more aggressive and internationalist or interventionist role abroad. And they argue that this means that the country has to move toward a, f a far greater militarization of civilian life than had previously existed. The country needs a centralized national security apparatus in the executive branch. It needs to organize political decision making around foreign policy by empowering members of a permanent defense establishment that link both military and civilian experts together, that it needs far greater secrecy in foreign policy, it needs practices of conscription, a much larger standing army. In the early Cold War period, all of these ultimately become foundational principles and practices of how we do foreign policy and national security. In the early 20th century, if anything, this would have been viewed as un-American. The classic position throughout the 19th century was that having a standing army was inconsistent with Republican principle. A standing army, and a big standing army, is what you got in Europe. That's what led to military despotism. That allowed executive leaders to use the army to suppress their own citizens. A lot of Americans, too, going all the way back to Hamilton's speech for Washington when he left office as president in 1796-97, said, well, the way that we protect our freedoms at home, and this, this still has a strong strand in American politics and should be somewhat familiar, is by being safe behind the oceans and avoiding getting involved in international affairs. These are two strong positions, isolationism and a rejection of a large standing army and a permanent defense establishment. And these folks that are tied still in various ways to business and political elites, but are also represented in the Progressive Party, in various, in the Democratic Party, in the Republican Party, they start arguing that, well, how is it that you can justify a strong national state as American? And one of the key ways that you can justify a strong national state as American is ultimately through a reference to the Constitution. The argument that they make is that the Constitution is the practical embodiment of American exceptionalism. The U.S. is the country where Enlightenment principles came down to earth. And America since the Mayflower Compact, so these are the arguments that are made by David Jane Hill, who is an ambassador to, uh, to Germany, is the president of the University of Rochester, not too far away from here. The, the, the U.S. has stood since its initial founding, earliest days, for principles of self-government and limitation, limitation of political power. And that's what's expressed by the Constitution. What you see in Europe instead is a commitment to absolutism and empire, unlimited authority. And that the world in the early 20th century is racked by chaos and instability because European powers have dominated global decision making. And they've dominated global decision making based on a principle of absolutism and empire and that the U.S. has a responsibility both to ensure a global climate of security and also to ensure that the developments in Europe don't come to the U.S. and undermine our own domestic security and that the U.S. can play this role because the Constitution has been the country's guiding principle. It's, a, it's based on self-limitation. It's a commitment to democratic self-governance. And so when the U.S. asserts power abroad, it effectively asserts power in the interests of communities abroad. This thought about the link between American interests and global interests emerges during this period, and by the time we get to World War II, is really deeply entrenched. So when Swedish uh, commentator Gunnar Myrdal on American race relations and American dilemma talks about the American creed, he says, the US is the world in miniature. 
its interests are the world's interests. Now, not only does the Constitution give national security actors or those that are defending a strong national security state that want the US to get involved in World War I, a positive principle, there's this symbiotic relationship, which is the national security context and fears about threat help provide a mass base for constitutional support, one that had not previously existed. That if before supporting the Constitution was tied to business interests, you have more and more Americans that do feel threatened by developments in Europe, by the rise of socialist politics in the US, especially as a consequence of various kinds of of immigration from Europe. And that for these citizens, the Constitution, whatever its flaws, spoke to a kind of golden age of the Republic. Now, we might be suspicious about how golden this age was because it was tied to things like slavery and lots of other practices that we might be uncomfortable, but, but there's a significant base of Americans that say, whatever the problems with the Constitution, it should be defended. And in this way, a strong commitment to national security and to American power abroad goes hand in hand with a strong defense of the Constitution at home. Groups like the National Security League, almost overnight, even though they're largely funded by business, especially in New York City, they have memberships of as large as 100,000 in 1916. The American Legion, so soldiers that come back from the war, large scale organizations with mass membership. But there's still a problem, and the problem is, if now there's a mass base for constitutional support in a way that wasn't the case previously, the environment was one of profound conflicts and disagreements between social constituencies that still have a lot of concerns about the kind of political outcomes and whether or not the Constitution itself is a democratic structure. So there are a lot of people that still have real concerns about the Constitution, and now you have a growing group of individuals as well that want to defend it. And so you see in the years around World War I, the rise of really the first and in some ways most extensive kind of civic, business, legal, governmental effort to promote the Constitution as something that's fused with patriotism and national identity through a variety of different patriotic educational campaigns, um, laws that were built <clears throat> around Americanization and teaching Americanization as tied to the Constitution, things like English-only laws and the elimination of non-English language newspapers. I'll talk about what the connections are. And then through actual repression. So the use of anti-sedition laws to cut down on uh, nonviolent political advocacy against the war, against positions that are viewed as increasingly un-American. All of these different practices were built around a theory of citizenship that's quite different from how we think of our Constitution. For many constitutional scholars today, including myself, when I think of the constitutional tradition, what I think of is a self-reflective, self-critical practice of debate and dissent. So our Constitution Day events at Cornell or many other universities are an opportunity to, to engage with the hard questions about constitutional right and wrong. At this moment, the brand of citizenship that's being promoted by the Constitution is one that's deeply reverential and deferential. It's built around ideological uniformity. And folks need to agree. And you can see why there's an emphasis on this. This is a moment when basic questions about how the government should be organized, how the economy should be organized, are really out there on the table. And depending on your position, that's a good thing, because that, that means that you're going to get better outcomes, or that's a really bad thing, because that suggests profound instability. And so the goal of a lot of the educational campaigns around the Constitution, the goal was really to limit dissent, to raise the Constitution above dissent, and in the process to tame disagreement. So we have the very first Constitution Day events, the first National Constitutional Day is 1917. It's the National Security League that sponsors it across the country. You have 
move to teach ed the Constitution in schools. So by the early 1930s, 43 states had laws mandating the education of the Constitution. And the textbooks that are written by organizations like the National Security League or the American Defense Society for schools, the textbooks that are written aren't like our constitutional textbooks today, again. They're based on a kind of ritualistic question and answer. So questions will be, what is the balance wheel of liberty? Answer, the, cons the Supreme Court. Question will be, why are rights better protected in the US than France or England? Answer, the Supreme Court. And students are supposed to memorize these responses. Similarly, the focus, <laughs> the focus of a lot of the, the lectures, speeches, the focus isn't on rights. Today, when we think about the Constitution and its symbolism, we think of rights, the Equal Protection Clause, the First Amendment. The focus instead is on duties, being willing, sometimes through force of arms, through military participation, to defend the Constitution against threat. And, and again, the emphasis is on founding fathers and reverence for those founding fathers. Interestingly, a key founding father that's emphasized is George Washington. And you might think, well, today when we think of the Constitution, we think of Madison and Hamilton. Washington, yes, he was the president of the convention, but he didn't really have a central role in writing the text. Why Washington? And again, this is a moment where there are a lot of Americans, in fact, the dominant academic position presented by Charles Beard is that the Constitution was a move away from the Declaration of Independence and the principles of the Revolution because it undermined democratic majorities being able to pursue policies. And the link of Washington to the Constitution is a way of saying here is a revolutionary figure that was also a constitutional supporter and that the two things should be joined. And the focus on fathers, founding fathers, is a way of also saying that the Constitution was produced by people that are wiser than us today in the present, the present of 1900. And so we should not dabble too extensively in constitutional change. Even the great, let's say, aesthetic art achievements of constitutional veneration during this period, we might be concerned with. So the great aesthetic product of the era is the Supreme Court building. I don't know if it, uh, many of you or some of you have seen the Supreme Court building. Well, this is going to, this might, uh, make you feel unhappy, but the Supreme Court building was designed by a man named Cass Gilbert, who was a very important architect during this period and was also very closely aligned with a number of these organizations. And Cass Gilbert at the time was really interested in the revival of neo-Roman architecture under Mussolini's Italy. And he actually went to Italy to get the stone in Siena to build the Supreme Court building. He met with Mussolini personally. He sent the designs to Mussolini. And he saw the building as, above all, meant as an imposing architectural symbol of the authority of the law and the fact that the Constitution and the Supreme Court should enjoy absolute public support, that the citizen would look with awe at the building. So this is a different, different era. And alongside this, you have a number of other policies that we might find problematic. So we have policies at the time that were tied to the Constitution that don't necessarily seem on their face to be tied to the Constitution, of Americanization that emphasized ethnic homogeneity, so English-only education, um, uh, English-only newspapers, the elimination of foreign language newspapers. And the thought here was that Yes, the Constitution stands for universal principles. Everybody in principle can be American. But the Constitution is the product of a unique, a specific American cultural heritage. And new communities, particularly from Europe, new immigrants that might be involved in the labor movement, that might be joining these socialist parties, they should be viewed with some degree of suspicion. Yes, they're talking the same language. They're talking the Enlightenment language of republicanism and democracy and equality, but they've been educated in an absolutist and feudal Europe, and they don't have the cultural predispositions 
that those of us already here have. And for that reason, we have to engage in an extensive project of making uniform and standardizing a single American identity through education, through language, through eliminating all of the cultural pluralism that might have existed at the time. And in fact, this is even used as an argument to defend segregation in the South. African Americans were given a chance to rule uh, following the Civil War during Reconstruction. And the reason why the, Civil, the Reconstruction failed according to this position, which has been thoroughly repudiated over the last 50 years in uh, Civil War and Reconstruction scholarship, is because African Americans uh, were corrupt and didn't exercise power appropriately. And so they too need a period of tutelage so that they can understand constitutional principles. And then for those that are truly can't be reconciled, can't be Amer made American, there needs to be strong laws that use treason trials and sedition to arrest those that are dissidents. And one of the great champions, academic champions, of the, of the Constitution in the 1920s, a man named Charles Warren that won the Pulitzer Prize for his really magisterial history of the Supreme Court, had been in the Attorney General's office during <coughs> World War I, had been the primary author of the Espionage Act, the Sedition Act, a number of other bills during the war, and had actually eventually been fired because he thought those bills weren't going far enough, and he wanted treason trials, and barring treason trials or military trials, overseen by military judges for citizens and non-citizens that engaged in nonviolent speech in opposition to the war. So this is a different atmosphere. So what are the, the contemporary implications? And I'll take about five more minutes and, and stop here. This is not, in many ways, our constitutional tradition. And so we can think of this period as maybe this is a you know, problematic or disturbing early history, but it's not one that really tells us anything, you could say, about how we think of the Constitution today. And I want to say that there are at least three different ways where there's a, there's a living legacy of this era. So again, this is an era where you see the rise of the Constitution as having a mass political base, but it's not the period where the Constitution wins. There's still a ton of opposition and concern during the, the, the Great Depression, that there are political developments between the New Deal and Brown versus Board of Education that, that essentially sweep aside a lot of the opposition that had existed in the mid-20th century. And it's not for many decades that the Constitution wins. But this is the period that sees the initial growth that becomes permanent support for the Constitution and a permanent fusing in public life between being American and supporting the Constitution. It's so important as an initial moment that in 1936, when the Communist Party is trying to develop its own strength in the US, and the executive secretary, a man named Earl Browder, is pressing a policy of communism as 20th century Americanism, he would give stump speeches, including one at Cornell's campus that was written up in our Daily Sun, where he'd carry with him in his pocket the Constitution as proof of his communist bona fides. <laughs> to believe in the Constitution is to believe in communism. So this is a time when, you know, that's a kind of argument that 30 years ago, folks wouldn't need, feel the need to make because the circumstances were different. So what, what's the, the contemporary relevance? First, a lot of the things that we like today about the openness, the space for dissent in our constitutional tradition, the fact that it's flexible to encompass lots of different perspectives, in some deep way has to do with the fact that you had this earlier period of repression, of making the Constitution safe. Many of the issues that were on the table then really aren't on the table today in terms of basic questions of how the government should be organized, what kind of economy should uh, should dominate both public and private life. And in a sense, we can have more open-ended conversations about constitutional meaning because the terms of our disagreements have been narrowed. And once again, you can think of this as a good or bad thing, that we might be glad that these terms have been narrowed because we don't want to open up the Pandora's box and the forms of instability that might emerge if we have much more extensive political disagreements. But on the other hand, we might 
be suspicious about what some of the consequences of our more limited public conversations have been and the role that invocations and evocations of the Constitution have played in limiting those public conversations. This is a way of saying that maybe we can't separate our self-reflective, critical constitutional culture today from this more deferential and hierarchical one because the two have been bound together. The one, in some ways, was the condition of the other. The second thought is, the Constitution has played a central role, particularly since World War II, and I can talk a little bit about the centrality of World War II, in our reform traditions. The Constitution played a central role and continues to play a central role in, in civil rights politics and arguments about the creed and the very same claims about American exceptionalism and universalism. This is a country that speaks to the interests of all. And this has been a, a language of social change. But it's also had its flip side. It's the same language that's a justification for expansive American involvement and the kinds of security institutions and executive authority that goes hand in hand with having a permanent footprint around the world. So the Constitution both undergirds our reform traditions, but in some ways not that differently than the World War I era, it also undergirds arguments about American special destiny and the reason why certain prerogatives and certain forms of militarization in civilian life are essential. That when Obama makes arguments about why we have to engage in multiple military operations across the world, especially in the Middle East and parts of Central Asia, he's playing from a similar set of arguments that go all the way back to this earlier period. And then the third and final thought and this gets back to the very first point that I started with, which is, you know, why is it that you have academics, some academics, saying, you know, the Constitution, there are many constitutional traditions, there are many different ways of organizing a Constitution, and the one that we have, the structure of it, the ways in which it divides power, the ways in which it allows money and those with various forms of influence to have untoward authority over decision making, um, why is it that those arguments don't have kind of public support? And I think, or let's say not public support, why is it that they haven't been able to breach the arena of political elites? And I think the reason has to do with a very different way that we think of the Constitution. We think of the Constitution as a symbol as organized around rights protection, as tied to a story about American exceptionalism and the things that we're most proud of in the 20th century, including these reform traditions. And we don't necessarily think of the Constitution as a structure, as a form of government that makes certain outcomes more likely and other outcomes less likely. And in a strange way, the culture of veneration has made it more difficult for us today to have those conversations about how political decision making should be organized and what structures are actually most consistent both with democratic principle but also with the kind of policies that the majority of Americans might want. So I'll stop there. <laughs>
to respond to this threat. The second kind of threat was a concern that Madison had with what he called faction. And in particular, what he was really worried about is what now folks call majority tyranny. The ways in which a majority can inhibit the rights of different minority groups. And we can think of lots of different majorities and lots of different minorities. What the founders did not have in mind as a concern is a third kind of threat. And I think that's the threat that progressive uh, activists focused on, and that's something that I think we should be concerned with today, which is the kinds of threats that socioeconomic elites, in other words, those with real economic power, um, are able to wield over the political process. In many ways, if you're poor or disenfranchised, the only resource that you have is numbers. And we have a political system that makes numbers, sheer numbers, um, increasingly difficult as a resource to use to pursue various kinds of policies through lots of different constitutional elements, through the structure of the Senate, the fact that the Senate <laughs> essentially gives uh, extensive power to different geographical spaces and bases, regardless of whether or not that's particularly represent representative because of the nature of the Supreme Court, because of the division between state and federal power. And all of these divisions, again, mean that if you have economic power, if you can wield economic power as a resource, you can find levers, quietly, silently, to get your policies affected through the national tax code, through local practices at the state level. By contrast, the kind of big picture policies that you know, might benefit large majorities and fairly large majorities might support could be quite difficult to implement, and even if they're implemented, <coughs> might be undermined by the attention that has to be played to, to, to various actors that have, uh, that can wield economic influence. So I think that there are real problems with the structure of the Constitution. I also think that the American Constitution in many ways is a global outlier, and not necessarily for good. Our Constitution looks a certain way, and this is how, in America, we've come to think of what a Constitution is. It's short. It's 4,400 words. It doesn't have positive rights prescriptions. So there's no, there's not like a statement about a universal right to health care or education. It has very limited rights provisions. Its language is largely vague. In other words, there's not specific policy stipulations. There, is a very difficult amendment process. It's really hard to change the Constitution. Now, globally, the basic constitutions that have emerged over the last half century that you see in Brazil and South Africa and India look really different. They tend to be much longer. They have more extensive rights provisions. They're much easier to amend. In some ways, if our Constitution's up here, it's a higher law, and ordinary legislation, let's say, is down here, the constitutions and the design vision of the constitution that we see globally has been somewhere in between. It's more accessible by organized political majorities, and one might say for bad, but you could also say for good, because it's an instrument that can be used in political life without believing that to constitutionalize something is to really freeze our disputes and disagreements. So I do think that there's some real problems with the design vision and the constitutional structure. But I'm not sure that the solution really is anything like a convention. Precisely because we live in a political moment where if we were to have something like a second constitutional convention, who would dominate that convention? It would be the same forces in some way that I've described that dominate elements of our political process. And so what I suggest is that through this history, maybe being willing to take the Constitution down a peg and to think creatively about both what our reform projects should be, what our democratic goals should be, and to imagine ways perhaps within our constitutional order to engage in various kinds of constitutional innovation change 
that takes seriously the concerns of a century ago. But I don't think any of that can really start as long as there's knee-jerk and kind of ritualistic assertions of the Constitution is inherently fused with patriotism. To have questions about the Constitution means that you're unpatriotic. <coughs> Thank you. I guess, the, I guess the question that arises from your, your proposed reopening of it, which is essentially to cut to the chase, uh, the very uh, oligarchies which already exist, which prevents that from deforming the process that you envision. I think one of the great strengths of the Constitution is, to some extent, its vagueness. It has allowed, mm -hmm. it has allowed a, a nation of immigrants from million different kinds of backgrounds and cultures and societies to reorganize themselves in a very general way to form what Governor Morris wrote in the preamble, to form, in fact, a more perfect union, mm -hmm. provide for the common defense, to enhance the general welfare, and to, and to establish, a, in effect, a means by which experimentation and trial would prove how the, con how the country would move forward. The constitutions that I know of, and I'm not a constitutional expert, but the ones I know of that are not this constitution, but have been formed elsewhere, in many cases are filled with specifics which have divided and, and, and allowed, allowed oligarchies to exercise extraordinary power because of the way those constitutions are, are devised. The vagueness of this one leaves it in a, in a very experimental place in every way. And a lot of the specifics which I think you're suggesting are not there because they understood they did not know what the civilization would require of itself going forward. In my view, the First Amendment is a perfect example of that. It's a few words. They didn't set up, um, they didn't set up Freedom of Information Act. They didn't set up uh, immunity, legal immunity for reporting. And so we have this going on. They knew it was going to be a struggle back and forth between, between journalists or those who wanted free speech and those who didn't. And the, the nation going forward would have to figure it out for itself as it went along. And I think that's the power of why the Constitution, as we understand it, at least in, the, in my generation anyway, of which I can remember seeing the Constitution on the Freedom Train in 1948. There may be people here remember it coming here to Scranton. Uh, I saw the actual documents, and there's a kind of veneration of that because it became something written 200 years before, which had viability and efficacy in in the nation that we were creating every day. So, you know, I, I, think this, I think no, it's a, 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 a powerful <laughs> set of points. So, um, do you mind if I just take a little bit of time with some of the different elements? So, first about the benefits. And, and weaknesses of vagueness versus specificity. Today, globally, there's probably, you know, I might be, I'm going out a little bit on a limb, so I uh, apologize in advance, but the other political community that has something approaching our own tradition of veneration for the Constitution is South Africa. So South Africa's Constitution <clears throat> in South Africa is viewed with profound reverence. The Supreme Court there is also held, the Constitutional Court is held in incredibly high, self, uh, high esteem. There's a set of architectural developments that are built around the Constitution. That Constitution, though, looks very different than our Constitution. So that's a Constitution that's more like the one that I've described. So it's one where you, you do have extensive rights provisions, you have a relatively um, flexible amendment process. You, it reads, in some ways, more like the ACA, the healthcare bill, than it does like our Constitution. It's incredibly long. So you can have different cultures that have venerative practices toward a Constitution with different design principles. These different design principles have clear strengths and weaknesses. The benefit of vague language is that 
folks don't necessarily feel that their political views have been rejected because you can engage in, let's say, contestation within consensus. Now, the problem, though, is that that vague language in the American Constitution is built in a system that's very difficult to change textually. And when American academics and elites have tried to promote the American Constitution abroad over the last 20, 30 years, it's faced a lot of popular pushback. And you can understand why it might face popular pushback, especially in transitioning societies. So if you're in a government or in a, a country that's faced war, that there's real cleavages and disagreements, you might prefer to have a really long constitutional text that has a lot of explicit language, but has explicit language that in some ways is contradictory. Here's a right to education, here's the protection of property rights. Everybody gets what they want in the text. That is easy to mend. In other words, it's not fixed. You don't feel like if you lose, if you lose at the founding, you're gonna lose forever. And so it's more likely over time to develop consensus because the Constitution is part of a set of legislative practices. The worry there is that if you have a constitution that looks like ours, so vague language but fixed and hard to shift, you might get contestation within consensus. But folks that lose at one early stage might believe that they're going to lose forever. Now, in the American context, I do think that our constitution has been really good at serving a set of ends. And this set of ends has to do with the rise, in some ways, of a rights culture in the 20th century. So one of the things that really changes about how the Constitution is interpreted in the 30s, the 40s, and the 50s is that in the 30s, the 40s, and the 50s, especially in the, let's say in the 30s before World War II, the First Amendment I wouldn't say it's a dead letter, but the First Amendment doesn't have nearly the kind of practical political teeth that it has today. And when people think of what the Constitution does, the First Amendment isn't necessarily the, that comes to the fore. But the First Amendment, you know, lots of different laws, like I mentioned the Espionage and Sedition Act, these were laws that were viewed as perfectly consistent with the First Amendment in the context of World War I. What starts to happen um, is two things. First, you have a legal culture that says, hey, we can play around with the meaning of these words. And so we can use these words to pursue a variety of different legal outcomes that may or may not have been consistent with what the framers intended. And so during the New Deal, rather than necessarily requiring a constitutional convention or formal amendments, you have New Deal actors that say, well, we can reinterpret the Constitution through a shift in Supreme Court jurisprudence to say that various policies are constitutional. And similarly, during World War II, with the example of Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, uh, you have Americans saying, well, now we can use Supreme Court jurisprudence to develop, essentially kind of out of whole cloth, a First Amendment jurisprudence that's tied to what it means to be American. And then we see similar arguments in the context of <coughs> Race relations, where the court can use this vague language and these principles to defend, again, a set of reform projects. All of these things have produced outcomes that I think are absolutely beneficial. But the one, say, tension that I would raise is that the Constitution isn't just totally open-ended. It's not just a vague set of documents. It also has fairly hardwired features. It has that Senate. It has the structure of federalism. <coughs> and those hardwired features are difficult to change through just interpretations by justices or changes in public climate or sentiment among legal elites. And I think one of the concerns for the present is that we're very different than, say, transitioning Societies that are moving from being colonized to moving independent, or that are developing, or that have 
just come through an extensive war. We, there's lots of differences. But one thing that maybe isn't so different is that we have a set of political actors in D.C. but elsewhere that in some ways because of the political process can't necessarily produce policies that you have widespread support. And there's a disconnect between what citizens might want from their government and not just what the people we've elected want but what the institutions make more and less likely. It's not just your disagreement with the turn of the Republican Party. That's why, for example, folks, Congress has approval ratings of 13, 14 percent, the lowest in history since the Pew started engaging in those polls. It also has to do with these hardwired features that in various ways make the possibility of political decision making and the kinds of decision making more difficult. And this is a, a consequence of having a fixed text that's hard to change. I add one more thing, which is the Freedom Train is a really interesting um, additional moment. So the Freedom Train emerges out of a period in 45, 46, where you have the highest numbers, interestingly, in American history saying that we should move away from the Constitution. It's really the only period since the 30s where you have polling where more Americans than not say that the Constitution needs to be fundamentally changed. And that tells you that this is a time when Henry Wallace is, in some ways, the most popular politician in the US. There's an extensive conversation in the wake of the war about whether or not there needs to be a new, a new, new deal and a further investment in things like basic income, full employment, a stronger social welfare net. And all of these are policies that, because of the nature of the constitutional system at that time, the power that was given through the Senate to Southern Congress people and to Southerners that had disenfranchised effectively their own black base, these policies were not possible. The structure of the Constitution in some deep way made them impossible. And you have extensive disagreement and the rise of the Cold War, Cold War enthusiasm about American principles in the Constitution is a product of concerns with this disagreement. This includes the move by private organizations that, to bring the freedom train across the country. And also to select which documents. The Constitution was there, but members of labor wanted the Knights of Labor original Constitution to be there. That wasn't selected as part of the documents. There was a set of choices about which text would be viewed as, let's say, our Bible, and which would be removed from our own secular Bible. And it produced outcomes too. So in the South, you had a freedom train that if you wanted to, to look at the freedom train, the audiences were divided based on race. There was a segregated entrance to the train to look at the freedom train. And this speaks, I think, to the contradictions of that moment that are about the cultural values of the time, but also the policy outcomes that had been generated in some way by the structure. Yeah. Would you comment on the rise of veneration or lack of rise of veneration of that earlier document, the Declaration of Independence? So the, the, the Declaration, I mean, the Declaration is also, a, I mean, it's a, it's a deeply venerated text. And it's venerated, I think, far more consistently across American history. So the antebellum period, really the only constituency that's an organized constituency that engages in extensive, um, let's say, disaffection or disavowal of the Declaration are African Americans. So that the famous practice within the African American community in the antebellum period was that you do not celebrate American independence on the 4th of July. Instead, you celebrate American independence on the 5th as a sign of disaffection and the fact that this is the republic, that independence meant your own enslavement. But outside of that and the, the kind of opposition that emerges among Southern sectionalists who are diehard sectionalists that refuse to be incorporated into the, into the Republic that continues really through um, the 30s and beyond, um, outside of 
of that community later on that the Declaration, it's a fairly consistent document of veneration. But interestingly, what the Declaration means is really different. In some ways, the thinness of the Declaration allows it to serve even greater political purposes in, in public conversation than the Constitution. The, the Declaration actually isn't that thin a document. I mean, so when we think of the Declaration, we think of the language about, the, you know, the self the self evidence of the proposition that all all men are created equal. But that's only one bit of text. But the Declaration is also was a political act by Jefferson and others to explain grievances that justify independence, and it included a number of different grievances about the structure, of the economy, taxation without representation, um, grievances that also included. Uh, anger by Southerners that the, the British were arming and freeing African-American slaves, that one of the grievances is they're provoking domestic insurrections. So there's a recognition and support of slavery even in the Declaration. But fairly quickly, <clears throat> in some ways, that political context gets removed and there are debates about what the Declaration means. So. For Stephen Douglas, Stephen Douglas is Lincoln's great opponent in the Lincoln-Douglas debate. So he's a northerner from Illinois. He wins. He's the face of the Northern Democratic Party. He um, supports Union, but supports Union on grounds that will keep uh, the South as a viable, consistent political member. Um, his view is that if you read the whole document, yes, all men are created equal as key. But really what the framers meant was all white men are created equal. <laughs> Lincoln's position, and the position of radical abolitionists, as well as much of mainstream abolitionist thought, was that the Declaration isn't just about white men, it's about men generally. And the Declaration should be read as the motivating principle of the Republic, and that the Constitution should be interpreted through the Declaration, so that even if the Constitution in the antebellum period tolerates slavery, it has embedded within it the capacity to reform and get rid of slavery over time. Interesting that this view that Lincoln held, that Frederick Douglass held, was, had a moment in the sun, let's say, during the Civil War in the early days of Reconstruction, but was pretty marginal even through the period that I described. It's pretty marginal until um, the political debates in the teens, but especially in the 30s and 40s in the context of um, the confrontation with Nazism and the ways in which racism becomes embedded with authoritarian <laughs> opponents. So this is a fairly marginal position. But then there are other traditions of veneration of the, doc of the document, especially after the Civil War. African Americans engage in extensive acts of writing their own declarations of independence that are part of their political community. The labor movement engages in extensive acts of writing their own declarations of independence. And we can even see you know, various politics in the South from the move to secession all the way to the Southern Manifesto as invoking the Declaration of Independence as a tradition of resistance against an overweening and tyrannical government. So the Declaration is its own sort of venerated text. The thing that's interesting, perhaps, is that today, the dominant way of reading the Declaration is the way that Lincoln did. And it's one of the things that gives the Constitution its symbolic power. We read the, doc the Declaration the way that Lincoln did, as speaking to the inherent meaning of the Constitution, as standing for a project of equal liberty for all. It should be noted that for most of American history, most of Americans did not read either the Declaration or the Constitution in these terms. <laughs> Time for one more question. Oh, um, yeah. I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. I just. Well, I can't. Oh, I, the name of the book is. Uh, it's even worse than it looks. I believe. Or a lot. What? I, there are two gentlemen who wrote it. About um, that. I hate to be uh, Republican Democrat, but they. Uh, the one gentleman is from the American Enterprise Institute, I believe, but. They say that the Republican Party is acting like a parliamentary party. Um, 
under the rules of the Constitution. So that's what, why we have the political problem we have right now, because the Constitution allows them to deadlock whatever. If they were in a parliamentary system, they wouldn't be able to do that. They'd have to forge some uh, alliance with another group and modify their position. Yeah, so th th this, uh, uh, so I don't know the book, but I, this raises some important points, which is, there was a moment in this country that we don't always fully recognize, where we had what you might think of as a movement party that had control of the national government, and that actually wanted, not explicitly, because that would have been too difficult, but implicitly to move the country toward a parliamentary system, and that was the Republican Party of Reconstruction, and particularly radical Republicans. The folks like Thaddeus Stevens, they saw the goal of creating multiracial democracy across the country, and especially in the South, as requiring doing a few things. Fr enfranchising African Americans, but also disenfranchising those that had been disloyal. And this is the parts of the 14th Amendment we don't read. Sections two and section three were supposed to make it harder for whites in the South, if they wouldn't allow African Americans to vote, to be able to continue to exercise political power. And then through a number of different kinds of policies, things like the Tenure Act, which is supposed to limit the independence of the presidency, jurisdiction stripping on the courts, all of this was meant to create a unified party that would pursue, let's say, an egalitarian agenda, and that would move the country toward a parliamentary system, even having impeachment, impeachment of Andrew Johnson. The idea behind it is if you can get impeachment off the ground, then you can have a system of no confidence where presidents can actually basically face the same kinds of sanctions that you get with prime ministers. So that was a moment where there was an incipient desire to develop a parliamentary system. And in fact, many of the people that I was describing during the progressive period that had concerns with the Constitution wanted to move toward a parliamentary system of proportional representation and many different parties that would require different political groups to work together to get policy outcomes. Our political, our political structure, I'd say, worked best, and this is in many ways what was being referenced earlier, in the years after the New Deal, in the years between the 30s and the 60s, when we didn't have a parliamentary system, but we had a structure that allows for negotiation and compromise if you have two parties that are non-ideological. In other words, you have Democrats and Republicans, that essentially are not willing to go to the wall over first principles, but are willing to work together to produce policy outcomes, and you have folks on the court that are also similarly not viewed as ideological, so they're not going to necessarily strike down laws because of party preference. The problem in some ways at the present is that, you know, not necessarily for bad reasons, we have far more ideological parties, and really the, the right is far more ideological than let's say, the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party has more or less remained consistent, and the rights move further to the right. And so a lot of part of, you know, the studies about whether or not there's polarization are about the disconnect between, the growing disconnect between a fairly consistent Democratic Party and a Republican Party that's moved further to the right. But if you have a contemporary moment of highly ideological and divisive politics in a structure that works best without ideological division, then you have a real you have a mismatch. And this is, again, something that has to do with the structural politics of the time. And I should say one, once more that I, I actually don't find problematic the Republican Party behaving like a party of ideological commitment. Because in some deep sense, that's actually what you want. I mean, the, there are circumstances where you want your parties to be moderate, to make compromises. But you also want your party leaders to be willing to pay costs and take risks for principle. It tells us something interesting about the contemporary moment, that the Democratic Party, that has the word democratic in its name, that's supposed to represent from the New Deal working people, is a lot more elitist in the structure of its party. In other words, the leadership of the party and what the base wants. There's a bigger disconnect. And that there's a general sense that the base isn't going anywhere, so they're stuck with what the leadership is going to do. And you've seen this, I think, throughout the Bush administration and through the Obama administration in terms of the kinds of policies the base of the Democratic Party wanted, what it imagined it was electing, and what the leadership produced. 
That's interestingly different in the Republican Party. The Republican Party has faced a takeover from the Tea Party right. And now, that disconnect, let's say, between the elite, the Republican establishment, and its base is starting to become more of a concern. But it's a lot easier to have insurgent takeovers in the Republican Party than it is in the Democratic Party. So the, the ideological dimensions of this aren't wholly bad if you're thinking from pure kind of democratic representation. We want to thank, we want to thank uh, Aziz for a very stimulating and provocative talk. These are stimulating and provocative times that we will continue to do, be so after lunch. But for lunch we can talk, talk and argue and uh, eat. <laughs> Up the fifth floor, fifth floor. Thank you very much.